Hello and welcome to another Marketing Sherpa webinar. Thank you for joining us today. We've got a great case study about Whirlpool and how a simple test totally changed how they do their marketing. We'll be live streaming this so you can watch this to go to webinar as you are now or you can go to marketingsherpa.com slash live webinar. Something we're testing, we're experimenting here. You can see what's going on in the studio by going to that. It's this nice video stream. Uh, joining me today, the marketer we will be interviewing is Tom Mender, Senior Manager of Database Marketing at Whirlpool. Thanks for joining us today, Tom. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Dan. And so, as always, you can ask, we, we bring a high-performing marketer. We go through the steps he took to achieve a case study, to achieve a result, to make some change in his organization. And the slides we cover, the topics we cover, how quick we go, what slides we skip is all based on feedback we get from you. So ask us questions. Go to hashtag webinar. Let me know what you want to know from Tom. Also, share your own experiences with marketing, A-B testing, and all of that. Also, on hashtag Sherpa Webinar, we'll be sharing additional resources from our content that can help you improve your own marketing efforts. But let's get right into it, Tom. So give us a, just a quick uh, overview of your background. I understand you didn't really start in marketing, but then you, you came into it some way halfway through your career. Right. I was uh, actually I was born and raised in the IT area, so I was a code slinger for about half of my career and joined the marketing side about um, 10 years ago, uh, building out uh, marketing data warehouses and, and slowly progressing to, towards more uh, direct marketing uh, capabilities and um, predictive modeling and um, the optimization, things like that as, as, the, uh, as my career progressed. Excellent. I like that term, code slinger. Maybe that's why you weren't intimidated by getting started with A-B testing. So Whirlpool, you know, we know a lot about it. It's a huge company. What are some things that might surprise us about Whirlpool's marketing and, and the brands that you're working on? Well, I'm not sure if everyone knows. But Whirlpool actually manufactures several brands, including, obviously, Whirlpool itself, uh, Maytag, KitchenAid, Amana, uh, Gen Air is another brand. Um, so I'm not sure that's widely, widely known. Um, but, you know, one of the other things I think of, that may come as a surprise, especially for uh, a durable goods manufacturer, is we, um, uh, we've been increasing our total number of, of email volume every year to the point where uh, last year we hit the 90 million mark, which is a, a new high water mark for us. And uh, we're on track to probably uh, surpass that this year. Very impressive. A big established durable goods manufacturer like Whirlpool getting so involved in digital marketing. So give us an idea of your overall goals for this campaign and just for Whirlpool's marketing in general and, and kind of where you sit and, and how you function with uh, others in the marketing department. Sure. So um, I, I sit in an organization called the Digital Center of Excellence, Excellence or DCOE, and we're a shared service, and I support um, 14 internal clients. That's the brands, there's some e-business um, uh, business units, um, there's also some uh, other uh, areas uh, from the product category side as, as well as some B2C or B2B um, uh, units that, that we support as well. Um, and so, uh, as I said, we, we serve all these clients internally. And our main goal really with, with any of this is really, is really retention. Um, I think most marketers know that it's far less costly and easier to retain a consumer than it is to acquire one especially when you're a market leader like, like Whirlpool. So that's a big part of my job is to really keep that engagement going with our existing consumer set, always keeping these brands, uh, the consideration set within the consumer's mind um, at a very high level, and uh, really working with the other channels um, you know, throughout the marketing organization and, and creating sort of a cohesive um, journey for, for each of our consumers. Okay. And and it was going pretty well at first through the email marketing channel, right? Yeah, it was. It was. Um, we were doing a real good job out the gate, uh, and a lot of that was because um, the the number of brands, number of players in the field, were, were somewhat limited in the early years. So, we really didn't have to work very hard to uh, achieve pretty high um, KPIs in those first couple of years. Yeah, but then, and, and I'm sure no marketer wants to see this on their analytics dashboard more people were choosing to opt out from your emails and to actually click through. Why do you think that was happening? Well, as more brands began to, to join the mix, you know, we, we, we kind of saw these signals early on and tried to work with the, the brand managers uh, when we noticed this sort of decline in performance, but no one was really willing to give up their, you know, their piece of the pie, so to speak. They all wanted to talk to the same consumers um, and really make their numbers for the month. 
So it was really almost a free for all out there. So one day, uh, literally one day, we, we got some numbers back that kind of um, you guys see on the, on the screen right now where the number of people opting out of our email uh, marketing programs surpassed the number of people who were clicking through. So this was a nice visual way for us to demonstrate, okay guys, if we continue this sort of behavior, this is the sort of negative ROI that we're going to experience. Um, so uh, this was, here we're, we're losing more customers than we're, than we're gaining. Yeah, and I want to thank you, Tom, for coming on here today, for being transparent about the challenges you face, and, and really one of the things we do at Marketing Sherpa is try to inspire other marketers. And so you see a lot of case studies about marketers performing well and the ultimate results they get. And sometimes people come to us at summits and they say, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm so far behind, I can't do that. But even, even a marketer like Tom, a big company like Whirlpool, found themselves struggling. And this is where, this is where I like to say, <laughs> I was teasing Tom before, he went on his hero's journey, right? So Tom, in this case, is the hero of our story. Just like any hero, uh, like for example, when the, the movie hero's daughter gets kidnapped and all of a sudden he's a, he's a normal, calm guy and then he has to go off and go on a journey and find his daughter and, and, and uh, you know, beat all the bad guys. Well, Tom's journey, he faced that challenge, but his journey led him to Las Vegas, the email summit. So what did you learn at Marketing Sherpa Email Summit that helped you along your journey, Tom? Well, I think, that, to be completely frank with you, the first thing I learned was just how, how much I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot, there was a, a, a lot of folks uh, that were presenting and, and that I met at the, uh, at the summit uh, last year that um, really opened my eyes to, to some of the things that we should be doing out there. And so I, I think that was probably you know, my, biggest, my biggest takeaway. I also uh, quickly figured out that it was, that it was okay. You know, it was better to learn it now than than to learn it before it's too late, and so we were we were at a at a really good spot um, to, re, to to apply some of the the concepts that I learned at the back in 2013 to our current environment because we were in a kind of going into a bad place. Um, so nothing uh, you know spurs on change more than that sort of uh, event. So it was all it was like almost perfect timing for us. Excellent. Hopefully we can help people in some small way spur change to this marketing strip of webinar as well. And also, not only can you watch the slides and hear what we're saying, you can also go to marketingsherpa.com slash live webinar and see a video stream of what we're talking about today if you so choose. But So let's talk about the process that you had when you went to email summit. I mean, it's a process we hear from a lot of other marketers. You were just slammed, right? You were so busy just trying to get these emails out, it sounds like. You weren't able to give it that high-level strategic thinking. Uh, true. I mean, it was email marketing um, in those early early days was almost like a new toy. Everyone wanted to, you know, try it out and everything. And so we we did. We had several agencies that we were working with, um, combined with all the different, you know, the growing number of internal clients that that wanted to leverage, you know, this this new shiny uh, channel. Um, and the process was pretty much what you see on the screen there, uh, where the agencies or um, sometimes even internal resources we actually built creative. And that creative would then be sort of passed over to the to the brand managers who would make some tweaks to that creative, very minor tweaks usually. Um, once those were finally approved by the marketing managers, you know they would actually be you know, my job then would be to send them out to the to the end consumer. So it was it was very um, you know very sequential, very single threaded, uh, almost a one and done approach to this. There really wasn't a lot of learnings reapplied to the to the previous. Uh, uh, previous efforts or anything like that. Um, also, kind of started getting the feel that the the way creatives were being constructed were, were perhaps um, influenced by only you know one or two or you know just a very very small number of people in a room at any given time, as as opposed to more of a, a collaborative sort of uh, uh, venture. So uh, that that was it. It was it was you know pretty pretty straightforward. And many marketers today probably have a similar process. I'm sure everyone watching is kind of nod, nodding their head and, and can relate. Um, but you learned about A-B testing at Email Summit. And what about that really caused you to change your mind about taking a different approach? And this we see here is a quick look at the first experiment you ran when you got by. Yeah, so what, what I learned there was, um, you know, first of all, you, you don't have to, uh, you know, create a, a, a multivariate, you know, detailed test plan to, to get
get some learnings. And so um, the, the very first thing coming back from, from the summit was um, an opportunity that, that I identified with the campaign for the Willful Brand. And really this was to, to prove or disprove the theory of, of the number of, of call to actions within an email. And just understanding, you know, uh, that relative to the business objective in in mind, what was the best mix of call to action buttons within an email? So we wanted to uh, set up a, a really simplistic um, A/B test to just test some theories, you know, old old school ways of thinking versus some of the things that we learned at the summit. Yeah, one of the great things I think you did, Tom, was not just that you ran the test, but how you did it. You didn't want to upset the apple cart, you know. Whirlpool's a big company, there's agencies involved, there's a lot of marketers involved, but you had this list of 700,000, you had this email going out, and you just wanted to make one small tweak, and you also wanted to get the, the, all the brand managers involved, right? So how did you do that? How did you identify that small tweak and get those brand managers involved in this test? Well, it was, it was really um, a matter of literally sitting down with them face-to-face -face and, and showing them the, the creative that we were about to go to market with and just um, allowing them to sort of critique it one more time and just sort of ask some questions along the lines of, hey, does this kind of look like a landing page to you? Or do you agree that perhaps, you know, we're, we're, we're maybe giving away too much information here that maybe we should, you know, uh, thin it down a little bit and just get people to go to the next step of their journey here? You know, just kind of trying to make it their own um, and, and get their own input into the process was, was really the first baby step. And getting them to adopt, you know, even the notion of, of, of carving out half of their of their segment to uh, to perform a test on. So you got back from email summit. This was the email right here. You were about to send it to seven hundred thousand uh, potential customers. Why do we see all those links at the bottom, right? I mean, everyone makes decisions for reasons that seem rational to them, right? No one is going to make an irrational decision. I think. You know, other the marketers at your company felt the same way. That I think the key performance indicator, the KPI they were measuring this themselves on, led them to think that all those links at the bottom would help. And why why was that? Well, in 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 the past, uh, click through rates were computed based on the number of clicks on the email. And one of the things we were trying to change with our mar our brand managers was the the clicks on the call to action button that matter are the ones that we should really be what we should be tracking. Um, getting a click is, is not necessarily a good thing in some cases, especially if you're sending consumers off on a tangent somewhere in another part of the website, um, even opting out. I mean, all, all those things were, were, were part, of the, um, part of the numerator in this case. So we wanted to make sure that, that the clicks that the consumers were, were, were performing were relevant, and those were the ones that we were measuring ourselves against. So essentially, as we look, oh, go on. I was going to say, so um, as you can see, the, the number of, of call to action buttons in, in the original, uh, in the control version of this, of this creative uh, sent people to other areas um, of the sites versus the, the button that says C details. The C details button was the, was the relevant button that we were focused on at the time. Okay, so before we look at the results, uh, Adrian has a question. How many steps did you have before the conversion? Was was the, the click on the button considered the conversion for for this test? Well, I mean, we track you know all through throughout. I mean, so we, we literally look at at the opens, and then the, the the click on the button is considered a type of you know micro conversion. Then when they get to their destination after that click, we also we track that as well. So they're all part of the you know the funnel, if you will. Okay, and. And when we look here, we're looking at actual click-through rate, and you can see that you, as we talked about, you sat down with the brand managers, you identified four segments as a good database manager, looked at your segments in your database uh, that might tell you something more about the customer. But overall, across those four segments, just overall across all customers, 42% increase in click-through from just a small change. That's very impressive. We have a question here from Gene, a senior manager in marketing and business development. What resources and how many people were assigned to this project? What did it take to get this 42% lift? Uh, really, it was a collaboration with uh, the agency who actually created the, um, the the HTML to begin with, and also you know buy-in from the brand manager. So um, that, along with our internal resources that actually perform the um, the data work to, to split the, the list out uh, and things like.
like that. So it was definitely a collaborative effort against um, all those all those entities. So you ran the test, you got the lift. What did you learn from that? Well, I mean, I think we proved you know one thing that even minor changes like that were were completely counterintuitive to. Um, the brand, the brand managers, as well as the agency folks. I mean, this is we've been uh, operating in that old way for a number of years, and to just see these results and the, the speed at which we, we, we achieve these results was was, was really um, neat. It was, it was really good to see that, and they did have um, a real positive impact, and everyone can understand. Okay, the, the value of keeping consumers focused. Um, really keeping them um, on task with what the business objective is. Get them up to the next step of that consumer journey. In this case, it was to go to a landing page to download some, a rebate coupon. Um, so, you know, we also saw that where the um, these results actually spanned all the consumer segments that we tested against. So that was kind of interesting as well. So we don't see the results for this particular test. We have a question from Michael. How did opt-outs change during the test, if at all? Actually, they did not. Wrapped outs remain pretty, pretty steady throughout this this whole uh, this whole test. There's very little variation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you see, we talked about the previous process you faced, right? The opt out stayed the same, but the click through rate, 42 percent increase. When you talk about a list of 700,000, I mean that's just huge. And based on that, you helped change the process. And you were very smart the way you came in from this. You came back from email summit. You learned this. You didn't just say, "Hey, we're going to change everything right away." You just said, let's try this small test, right? Let's just take a few links off of our email, AB test it. You just said to the brand managers, what are some of the segments you want to learn about? So now that you have that 42% lift, how did you go about changing the process to what it is, what we see on the screen, and maybe you can walk us through what this process is and why it was so radically different for Whirlpool. Right, so um, when we got these learnings, the next step was really to immediately you know, embark on, on, another, on another test and keep, keep the momentum going. And part of that was really bringing um, the, the agency resources, uh, brand managers, you know, my team, all together, literally um, in a room to ideate on what are some of the um, theories that each of us have regarding whatever, whatever campaign was, was on the table, or whatever the uh, business objective, what should, what should we um, focus on? Well, you know, what is the, the, the main call to action or call to actions that we should uh, look at? And so, um, after this collaboration session, the agency came back with um, anywhere, usually it's now between three and five comps that we then review, put them up on a, on a whiteboard or whatever, uh, tack them to the wall, and really critique them. And we really usually will settle on you know, anywhere between um, uh, two to four, sometimes five different uh, uh, comps that we want to test against. Uh, once those those comps are then you know built as as uh, final creative, the, the marketing team still uh, approves them. We send them out. Of course, we build a test plan out and uh, execute the the test. We collect the results. And again, as I think Clint has said um, many times during these summits, you know the, the nice thing about the e the email space is you get your results so quickly. You can learn very very quick in this space. Um, all those learnings then are reapplied to the next. The next round. So it's now a very, as you guys can see, it's a very uh, cyclical uh, process now. It's not uh, single threaded um, with pretty much a throwaway mentality. Rather, there's a continuous um, learning curve that, that that's exists today, even even to this day. Yeah, and and you're learning about the customer to better serve the customer. Um, but as we saw, the difference between the two processes. I mean, this requires change. Change isn't easy. You know, people tend to want to do the same thing over and over. So here we see kind of a little flow chart you created somewhat to do a little perhaps internal selling to have others understand why they should make these changes. So can you maybe walk through that process of how you uh, talk to peer, your peers in marketing at Whirlpool and your agency to get them on board with this new process? Sure. I mean, it, it's really, you know, b building out a testing roadmap is, is fundamental to, to getting any of this, this off the ground. I mean, we really it would start with something as simple as possible. We've, we've gotten crazy at some, in some cases, but we've learned to try to keep it um, manageable. So in this case here, looking at the, um, the first layer of testing, we focused on subject lines. Uh, and that's standard operating procedure for us. Now, every email uh, campaign that we send out goes out with a subject line test. We usually try to get between four and eight subject lines in the hopper 
test those out against a subset of our audience, and then um, deploy the winner out to the mass, to the mass audience. Um, we focus on database segment performance. In this case here, you can see segments um, A through D, um, and that varies, you know, depending on what our target, target audience is. But we're always trying to learn more about the behaviors and reactions um, of, our, of our consumers um, with, every, with every test. And then, you know, the last layer there is, is pretty typical with call to action engagement where we, we, we do an A-B split. Sometimes it's A-B-C or even A-B-C-D tests, things like that. Um, always, uh, you know, applying this, this, this culture of learning, I guess. Okay, part of that so is is the process, but also I think you needed to just shift people's way of thinking and shift their paradigm about how you were marketing, right? Right. Um, so the the infamous uh, inverted funnel here. This is one that I. This is a visual that I've used a lot here at Whirlpool, um, and the reason I do was really to kind of shift the the expectations of email. What I mean by that is. In the past, an email campaign would go out, and if it didn't instantly and directly result in a, in, a, in a sale of a major appliance, then it was looked at as, well, gee, we didn't do a really good job here. Um, so part of the, this, this culture change here was the introduction of these, these micro decisions or micro conversions, whatever you want to call them, and really understanding the role of an email. And that is, is really to just um, provide the momentum up, up that funnel you know, for the consumer as they're going on this journey. In a, in, a, in a durable goods industry like this, where the product is generally in the thousands of dollars, it generally takes people quite a bit of time to make that, deci that final decision to purchase. So it was, it was using this visual to help our leadership understand, the marketing, the marketing managers and everyone else involved in this process, hey guys, the job of the email is really to get people um, uh, going in this journey, keep them, uh, you know, keep them moving up that funnel as much as possible. There's a lot of other um, uh, events that occur, whether it's on a landing page or in a retailer showroom or whatever, where the final conversion is, um, you know, takes place. If we do our job right, we've influenced the consideration set in the consumer's mind to be more biased towards whatever brand we're working with. Okay. We have a question here from Stephanie, a marketing manager. She wants ideas for subject lines to introduce a new service. And you can look at the subject lines on the screen and think to yourself, audience, which you think perform the best. But this, Tom, I think you're launching a new mobile app with these subject lines? Correct. OK, so take a look at these subject lines. Think of them which, think which performed well. Take, take your best guess. We're going to show the results in just one moment. But first, I want to let you know about Marketing Sherpa and Marketing Experiments Web Optimization Summit 2014 coming to New York City. May 21st to 23rd. You'll hear more, sto more stories, more case studies like this one from Whirlpool at this year's summit. It's going to be at the Times Center in the heart of New York City. You can see that picture. It's an absolutely gorgeous location. And we also have a $300 discount here for early bird pricing if you use the marketingsherpa.com slash WOS2014 link. That's marketingsherpa.com slash WOS2014. Great learning opportunity. If this A-B testing case study is interesting to you, there'll be much more at Web Optimization Summit. You can learn much more about how to improve your own testing, how to learn more about your marketing, maybe radically change your marketing approach like Tom did. So Tom, you were a speaker at our last email summit, but as we said, you were just an attendee at the previous Marketing Sherpa Summit. What was your experience as an attendee? No, it was, like I said, it was, uh, it was a real eye-opener for me. Um, going into it, I had really no idea what to expect. Um, to be completely honest, so it was it was a real eye opener, just um, you know rubbing elbows with with folks that had some really deep roots in this space and, and learning a lot just from from them, let alone the the speakers. So I uh, highly recommend it to anyone who's considering it out there. Well, thanks, Tom, and I hope to see you at Web Optimization Summit. Come up and say hi if you are able to come out and join us. Uh, but let's let's take a look at that subject line test that we just talked about. The winner, 17.93 percent click. Uh, open rate, I assume the highest, is download this app, lighten your laundry load. Let's take a look at another subject line test where the winner is conquer laundry and list the wash squad. What have you learned about subject lines from some of these winning uh, subject lines in the test you've run, Tom? Well, I think in general, uh, Dan, what we've learned with subject lines is that they have a limited shelf life and you always have to be testing, as I said earlier. Um, sometimes personalization works, sometimes you know, action-oriented ones work. 
Um, so, uh, exclusivity has been the hot pony for us lately. Uh, you know, making consumers feel like they're part of an exclusive club. So it, it really changes, um, you know, almost month to month. So that's, I think, my biggest takeaway with subject line testing. And it's one thing, too, that I feel we, we almost got caught in was, was, was uh, it was almost take it for granted. You know, we'll just come up with some subject lines, pick the winner, and move on. Um, in recent months, we've, we've placed a lot more scrutiny on our subject line testing because uh, if people don't open up these emails, it's, it's, it's like they never happen. So recommendation to all you guys out there is, is don't take these for granted, but really do um, perform due diligence in, in every subject line test that you perform. So we also have another test here from you, a value proposition test, where you used an application theme versus a lifestyle theme for that same new mobile app. And uh, what were the results of this one? Yep. So you'll see lifestyle here is, is generally what, 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 what takes precedence in, in our space here. And this is uh, proven time and again for us. And then also we have another value proposition test. And in this case, you, the control treatment, the difference is you tested user-generated content from ratings and reviews. What did you learn from this test? Um, well. Uh, basically, what we learned with this one is, for some segments, uh, the user-generated content was made a huge difference. Um, we also learned for another segment, as you guys can see, that it did not do so well. And so we don't look at these things as a as a negative. If you're looking at the um, the negative 10.51 percent uh, drop there, rather we look at it as a learning and we adjust our creative accordingly. Excellent. This, again, these are just three of the tests we could share from Whirlpool. Overall, lots and lots of lifts, and they were able to change uh, results analytics dashboard that looked like this, change it to something that looked like this. The small changes had a big impact. Uh, Jim wants to know, he's got a question for you, did Tom meet any resistance internally from increasing testing? So we saw the results. What kind of resistance did you meet? You know, I think at first there was a little bit of, uh, little bit of pushback, but as soon as, you know, the nice thing, like I said, about email is that you get your results so quickly, and, and seeing the results, like like Daniel just showed on the previous slide, there, um, it was really hard for them to argue the value of it. Um, going into these things blind uh, is, is really not a wise way of, of, of operating. So now it's, it's like I said, it's standard operating procedure. There's absolutely no resistance to this. In fact, it's embraced. Yeah, and so we should, to get results like this, uh, you are running a lot of tests. And how do you keep track of all those tests and really share it with everyone on your team? Um, it didn't take long for us to realize that we could not keep up with the, the number of report outs we had to do. Um, running all these tests is great, but um, if you don't have a nice way of, of showing your results, uh, it's another form of like it never happened. Type of deal. So um, we embarked on building out a full suite of um, web-enabled dashboards, so to allow our marketing managers to go out and look at the results of these tests anytime they want, as opposed to us building PowerPoint presentations, um, is almost a full-time job. Um, so this was a real lifesaver for us to keep keep this testing culture moving. All right, excellent. So overall, Tom, what would you say from this entire journey, from originally facing this challenge with your email marketing, then you attended email summit, learned about A-B testing, came in very, very smart, how you just made those small changes, got the brand managers on board before you were able to create a bigger testing and optimization, really culture, a true culture at your company, and then get some very impressive results. What are your top takeaways for marketers on the call now? What can, what can they do when they leave this webinar to improve their own results? Well, I guess, you know, I think, you know, leaving the um, the summit and, and, and watching all the other webinars over the past 18 months or so, yeah, there's some gaudy numbers out there, 500, 600% lists and this and that, and, and, and that's great. I mean, I think it's good to, to set the bar that high, um, but I found myself thinking, I just need to get, do the basics here and get other people on board with this. And so it's just, it's just underscoring of the fact that you don't necessarily need to um, embark on a multi-month uh, project to uh, get some results right away and get the get the influencers behind you um, help them do some of the work for you in driving this change and it makes life a lot easier so that would I think be my, my biggest takeaway is just don't don't worry about changing the world on day one excellent we're all out of time thank you so much Tom for being part of the webinar today and teaching what you've learned to the marketers that are attending 
You're welcome. My pleasure. Thanks to all of you for attending as well. We're always trying to create our own data to improve these webinars for you. Please fill out the survey. Let us know what worked, what didn't, what you want to see more of in the future. If you're watching the live stream, the survey is just down below. If you're using GoToWebinar, the survey will pop up when you close out. Thanks again. Thank you.